Welcome to Baalbek, or rather to Heliopolis, as the city was called in Greek and Roman times. With its sanctuary of Jupiter, this city hosted one of the most magnificent temples in the entire Roman Empire. We have entered the city and now have arrived in its heart. Here, in the center of Heliopolis, we stand in front of the great sanctuary of Jupiter Optimus Maximus Heliopolitanus. This means Heliopolitan Jupiter, the best and the greatest. The title is an allusion to the god who presided atop the Capitoline Hill in the heart of the imperial capital at Rome. There he was called simply Jupiter, the best and the greatest. The plaza, paved with stone slabs, is surrounded on the city side by a semicircular wall as it opens on the entrance to the sanctuary, the mighty elevated hall of the Propylaea. We are familiar with such structures from other ancient places such as Jurassa in modern-day Jordan and its temple of Artemis with the court in front. Imagine it is the year 200 of our era. These half-open places served as spaces for gatherings and as places to sit to watch a spectacle. And so here, too, there are deep steps hugging the semicircular wall where people could sit and watch what happened on the plaza. They looked up to the sanctuary as if from the seats of a theater whose entrance hall towered in front of them like a large stage set. In the middle of the plaza stood several big structures, of which we can see only a few traces today. Some of the features once included tower-like altars, statues on high pedestals, and fountains and other water installations. Important streets once crossed through the semicircular forecourt of the Jupiter Sanctuary. Here we can imagine a daily bustling spectacle, again like on a stage with the great sanctuary as the backdrop. As we now go up and enter the sanctuary, we step out of the profane environment and into a sacred space dedicated to the gods. The monumental open staircase takes the visitor almost seven meters above ground level. The staircase is divided into three sections and framed by wide stringers. At the top is a portico with twelve high columns. It opens to the east while the back is closed off by a wall. The column shafts are made of rose granite, brought more than 1,000 kilometers from the Aswan quarries in Egypt's far south. You can see that some of the capitals were gilded. This was done in honor of Emperor Caracalla, who was said to have visited Heliopolis in the year 215 of our era. We know that two men, presumably in the emperor's inner circle, commissioned the gilding. They immortalized themselves with inscriptions still preserved today on pedestals under the columns. But now, let us turn our back on this scene, because we are about to enter one of the most magnificent sanctuaries the Romans have left us. A long space lies perpendicular to our path, illuminated by the light falling between the columns. Before us we see a large portal, with a huge central door over ten meters high, as well as two smaller side doors with moldings. The wall in which this portal is located was decorated with two rows of idiculi, one above the other. The Latin word idicula translates loosely as small temple. Archaeologists use it as a technical term for a niche in a wall decorated with a trim made of flanking columns topped by a pediment. We encounter the term again and again on our tour. We are now standing between the Propylaea and the altar court. It is one of the sanctuary's most idiosyncratic buildings because of its hexagonal plan, a rarity in ancient structures. The open court, about 30 meters in diameter, is enclosed by a colonnade with granite columns. Behind them are rooms. The hexagonal shape can only be seen from the interior, and only if you look closely. The walls on the east and west line up with the sanctuary's axes, as well as the east colonnade of the great altar court, creating spaces for large portals. The walls on the north and south sides, however, are oblique, 
they are the only ones not aligned with the sanctuary's strict rectilinear organization. Let us consider the spatial qualities to get a sense of the hexagonal court's function. On the one hand, it is a passageway, that is, the path to get from the propylaea to the altar court and back. On the other hand, it is a central plan building with its own strongly accentuated center. Such spaces were often used for meetings. Here, the four rooms behind the column portico open onto the middle of the court. All four are oriented to the court's midpoint. Someone standing on that spot could direct events in the court centrally or give a speech. The hexagon is probably an attempt to translate these two requirements, passageway and gathering space, into architectural form. We are situated in the altar court. It forms the core of the sanctuary and at over 120 by 120 meters is also the largest section of the entire complex. This is certainly where the most important activities took place, the area where sacrifices and prayers were offered and people congregated. If we look north, we see before us the small altar and like the great altar, it is a tower that could be entered. Who was allowed to climb up its internal staircase, and for what purpose, and on what occasions? Were sacrifices or prayers offered up here? Certainly its design, too, comes more from local Eastern traditions than from mainstream precedents of Greek and Roman temple architecture. A high tower that can be entered is not commonly found in a classical Roman sanctuary. Like its larger counterpart, the small altar also provided a good view of activities in the sanctuary and perhaps also a look through the front door into the cella of the Temple of Jupiter. Does that mean both the small and the large altars attest the development of the same idea? Like so much else in the sanctuary, the small altar was modified at least once. Let's turn to our right. Our gaze passes over the great altar and over the east colonnade. In front of the south hall, which always casts shadows, lies the second basin. This one, too, has a small spring house in the middle, from which water bubbled, and a channel surrounding it for the runoff. The wall around it has smaller niches than does the northern basin, and here, too, we find wonderful reliefs with heads, sea creatures, and other, in part, mythological figures. Wait a minute. We have to climb a seven-meter-high staircase to enter the sanctuary. Since when does water flow uphill? There must have been a long gravity-fed channel that brought the water out here, a considerable technical achievement. Furthermore, this arrangement only works if the line at the far end started on the same or on a higher level. There still exists, in fact, an old water channel for delivering water from the mountains over a distance of some kilometers. Its starting point could still be seen in the early 20th century. It was located on the sanctuary's axis in the mountains opposite. From there, it would have carried the water downslope through the city into the sanctuary. Let's keep turning so we can see the main attraction. As we do, the enormous facade of the Temple of Jupiter comes into view. It is a gigantic mass of stone. The monumental open-air staircase the ten limestone columns of the temple's facade at the top, and the high pediment together tower nearly thirty meters into the air. Ancient coins show us that a statue of the sun god driving his quadriga across the sky once stood on the pediment's apex. Let's look at some details. The columns have a diameter of more than 2.2 .2 meters. The Corinthian capitals are up to 2.2 .2 meters tall, and each column is more than 20 meters high. The front of the temple had 10 of these colossal columns. We know of only a handful of 10-column temples in the entire Roman Empire. Where we are standing now is a very special spot, because from here we not only can look around in space, but also back in time, much farther back than Roman times. In Baalbek, the sanctuary of Jupiter is the place with the longest history, dating back a whopping 10,000 years. Every age has left its mark on this place. Many generations have built, demolished, and built over it again and again 
according to their needs. If we dig deep down beneath the present-day ruins of the sanctuary, we descend a good seven meters to the oldest level. We are situated where some years ago Lebanese archaeologists dug a trench that sliced through numerous layers of earth in which is preserved what people left on the ground when they rebuilt. Building materials no longer suited for reuse, objects that were discarded or lost, sometimes including a stone tool. Only rarely do we find a fragment of a figurine or, in a later deposit, a coin. The historical sequence can be read off the layers as they are peeled away by the archaeologists going lower and lower in digging their trench. The earliest traces found here date all the way back to the Neolithic, when the first ceramics appeared, but people still use stone tools and weapons. This means that they date to the 8th millennium before our era, that is, some 10,000 years ago. Since then, the place was repeatedly settled, and each epoch deposited its layers over the previous ones. Over the course of more than 7,000 years, an artificial hill, which Middle Eastern archaeologists call a tell, rose over seven meters high. This is why we had to climb that tall stairway to enter the sanctuary. The altar court's colonnades with their substructures cover a settlement hill which had remained hidden ever since their construction. Directly below the Roman pavement are remnants of Iron Age walls. The strata postdating the Iron Age are missing, doubtless because they were removed as the tell was turned into a Roman sanctuary. We're now atop the monumental open staircase and are standing in the Temple of Jupiter Optimus Maximus Heliopolitanus, the home of the god and one of the greatest religious buildings in the Roman world. To either side of us tower two of a total of 54 tall limestone columns. However, we are still far from entering what we call the cella, that is the actual temple chamber that housed the cult statue. Instead, we are standing in the peristasis, a covered space surrounding the building, so that we are no longer outside, but also not quite inside either. The peristasis is the hallmark par excellence of a Greek and Roman temple, but only the large temples had one. The smaller temples, and these were the vast majority, might have had only a few columns holding up the roof of a front porch, and by the way, we call the front porch the Pronaus. Our Temple of Jupiter has ten columns at the front and back, and nineteen columns along the sides. The Corinthian columns of the Temple of Jupiter stood so far from the cella wall that there would even have been room for a second row of columns. However, here at Baalbek, those columns were never present. We archaeologists have a term for this. A temple surrounded by a double row of columns is called dipteral. When there is room for a second row of columns, but as here it is lacking, we use a term that is a real mouthful, pseudodipterol, or falsely dipterol. Standing before the ruins of the Temple of Jupiter, we see before us a huge portal, some 15 meters high and 10 meters wide. However, we won't step through it just yet. This is the largest of all the temples found at Baalbek but it is the worst preserved. Why? Look to the right, and at some distance you will see there a high wall with arrow slits, obviously part of the 12th century castle. And right in the middle we see a column drum from the temple. We find many such repurposed temple parts. Using these so-called spolia was common practice in medieval times. Sometimes an entire building was torn down for the sole purpose of furnishing the building materials for a new structure so there is some hope that we can learn more about the temple from the spolia. Until we do, we honestly have no exact picture of what the inner sanctum looked like. And in that sense, our situation is quite like that of average visitors in antiquity who in most cases were not allowed inside. The portal before us is intended for the gods' use and is not just any ordinary doorway for mere mortals. Only under the most exceptional circumstances were normal people allowed to walk through it, and if anyone, then presumably mainly priests. We have a bit of evidence supporting this idea. 
Macrobius, a late antique author, tells the story of how the priests once came out of the temple to receive a gift to the god from a Roman centurion. Apparently such gifts were stored inside the temple. To get a gift inside where the god dwelled, the soldier had to hand it to the priests just outside the cella, and they then carried it back inside the temple. We are positioned on the so-called Great Altar. In order to get up here, participants of the cult could climb up a large staircase inside the altar, then, when they wanted to leave, they could go down another one. These staircases are a clear indication that processions led up here, so when we stand here, we can imagine being part of such a procession. But why should processions have led here? It is a most interesting place, because from here we can look down on the small altar and at the same time into the temple of Jupiter. And what do we see now inside the temple? We can only guess at the interior from here. At the far end of the cella, on a high pedestal in the innermost part of the temple called the Adaton, stood the iconic image of Jupiter Optimus Maximus Heliopolitanus. The image would certainly not have risen from the floor to ceiling, as did the many cult statues known elsewhere, such as the famous standing statue of Athena in the Parthenon in Athens, or the enthroned statue of Zeus at Olympia. As so often is the case in Baalbek, this statue is once again not preserved, but we have many small figurines, ancient replicas of the cult image. Several of the best are in the collections of the Louvre in Paris. Thanks to the generosity of the Louvre, you can see a picture of one of these figurines on your virtual tablet. Hence we know how the Romans imagined Jupiter Optimus Maximus Heliopolitanus as a youthful, beardless man standing tall in a long, sheath-like robe. In his right raised hand, the god wielded a whip. Why? Because the god of Heliopolis was not only Jupiter the sky god, but also the sun god, who in ancient art is imagined to be a charioteer driving his horses with a whip across the sky. In his left hand, angled in front of his body, he carried Jupiter's standard Roman attribute, the lightning bolt, symbolizing his control of the sky and its weather. But he also holds something else that is quite unexpected, some ears of grain, which also decorate the tall basket-like headdress that he wears. So, the Jupiter of Baalbek is the sky god, the sun god, and a fertility god, all rolled into one. In brief, he is a universal god, as signified by his long robe, decorated with the constellations. It is more common in Roman cults to find such multipurpose, or what religious historians call syncretistic gods, wielding an all-encompassing power, attracting worshippers from far and wide, even as far away as Carnuntum on the Danube River, which is over 2,200 kilometers from Baalbek. From here, let's look from the top of the entablature of the Temple of Jupiter at the surroundings below us. We are looking down from a great height. It's an almost 25-meter drop to the temple floor, 32 meters to the altar court, 40 meters to the ground between the temples. It was never intended that normal mortals could enjoy this view over the sanctuary. If anything, the temple planners must have thought that only the god Jupiter would perch up here and look down on his faithful as they approached him and his temple. To the god, the humans would have seemed to be small, even tiny figures engulfed by the vast area down below. He could have watched them approach from the Propylaea through the hexagonal court and then seen them attending to the sacred rituals in the altar court. From up here, the installations, the altars, and the ritual water basins appear well-ordered and symmetrically constructed. The solo visitor to the sanctuary without a map in hand and wandering around at ground level may not appreciate this fully, with so many fragments scattered around creating a rather chaotic impression today. Looking off to the right side, we have the Temple of Bacchus below us, also called the Small Temple, here at Baalbek. Only in Baalbek could a large, magnificent building like this be termed small. It's easy to lose your sense of scale here. 
Do you see that tiny line next to the upright column drum in the sun in front of the temple? Look closely. That's how small we humans are. And now we'll point out the features you can see from up here. We raise our gaze to look out over the city. Modern Baalbek, with its almost 100,000 inhabitants, stretches far in every direction around the temples. The ancient city, located primarily east of the sanctuary, was certainly much smaller. And yet, to the right of the Bacchus Temple in the southwest, we see the remains of a large colonnade that was part of a Roman bath. Behind it, in the distance, you may catch sight of a gilded dome. Just before it would have been the limits of the Roman city. In antiquity, the Temple of Jupiter was overshadowed by the Temple of Mercury on the city's Sheikh Abdallah Hill, possibly named after a 15th century Islamic scholar. Today, the remains of that hilltop temple are so scanty that you probably won't be able to make them out from here. And on both sides to the east and the west, the great mountain ranges of Lebanon and anti-Lebanon border the fruitful Becca Valley. Above it all stretches the blue, cloudless Lebanese sky. Just look at this huge block, and note the young lady who kindly agreed to pose for our photographer in order to provide a human scale. It is a piece of the Temple of Jupiter's entablature, the uppermost part that rests on the columns and in turn supports the roof truss. The lion's head at the top in the middle has its mouth wide open. But don't be afraid, it's only a spout for the rainwater gutter, if a dramatic one. When it rained, it must have looked as if the lion was literally spewing forth water. It's a nice solution to a mundane technical problem, isn't it? Lions like this were once located directly over every column. While lion heads as rain spouts in classical architecture are common, they are usually relatively small and schematically carved. In contrast, this lion is an extraordinary phenomenon. His facial muscles, his eyes, the wild, straggly mane, everything about him says power and energy, dynamism and tension. You could swear that the whole animal will jump out of the stone any minute now. Perhaps that's why it's so popular with Baalbek's visitors, not only today but also a hundred years ago. Among the German archaeologists who continue today to do research in the sanctuary and in the city, it is called the Tourist Stone. It seems to be indispensable for all visitors to be photographed standing in front of it. Maybe some of that lion's courage will rub off on anyone who dares to stand directly under his fearsome head. Have a look at your virtual tablet to see an historic photograph showing the scene. In it, we see a young man posing in front of the stone in boots and wearing a pith helmet with all the dignity and pride he could muster. That enormous mass becomes the backdrop, the stage for the young man's performance. Here I am taking my stand, he seems to be defiantly proclaiming. We are standing in front of the second great temple in Baalbek, the Temple of Bacchus. It was so designated by the German archaeologists of the early 20th century who found its architectural remains decorated with many images alluding to Dionysus, the god of the theater and of wine, revered by the Romans. He is also known as Bacchus, or Liber Pater. The temple stands on a high podium, which can be reached after we climb the monumental three landing staircase at the front. With the podium, the temple is 83 meters long, 36 meters wide, and 31 meters high. The actual house of the god, which we call the cella, is surrounded by 42 columns built from the local limestone. As with the temple of Jupiter, its big brother, the columns are composed of three drums each, and here too they are crowned by richly carved Corinthian capitals. The temple was covered with a now lost pitched roof, which had triangular pediments at its front and back. When was this temple built, and to which god was it really dedicated? In contrast to the Temple of Jupiter, there are no consecrations, no inscriptions that explicitly refer to this building, but it is depicted with its overshadowing neighbor on some Roman coins minted in the third century of our era. It was probably built around the year 200, when Baalbek was granted status as an independent city by the Roman Emperor Septimius Severus. But we can only guess whether it was truly dedicated to Bacchus, the god of wine, theater, intoxication, ecstasy, and fertility. 
But one thing is certain. Here we have one of the best preserved temples of the entire Roman Empire. After we have walked up the staircase to the Temple of Bacchus, past the fortress tower which was part of the 12th century castle, we enter the temple's colonnaded front porch, or pronaus. In antiquity, we would have stood in a roofed-over space and thus in shade again, whereas today the sky is seen above us. The columns of the Bacchus Temple are only slightly smaller than those of the Temple of Jupiter, but there are fewer of them, and the temple podium on which they stand is much lower by comparison. Between us and the actual temple door is a space that was open to the air but also covered. In the morning, when the rising sun shone on them, some twenty columns cast their shadows over this porch. What visitors can still see today is among the most impressive features that have been preserved in Roman architecture. A thirteen-meter-high portal is framed by a huge door frame whose two sides are each 1.7 meters wide. In two bands, we find the most beautiful reliefs, wine and ivy vines that push entwining upward, flower bouquets with ears of wheat and poppy pods rising from the most imaginative leaf bushes and repeating over and over. The ornamental flora are enriched with figures from the retinue of the god Dionysus, minads and satyrs, pans and cupids harvesting grapes, small animals, birds, reptiles, and insects found among the plants. A great variety of forms and life abounds. The ornaments that organize the individual bands are of the highest quality. You could admire this door frame for hours and still discover something new. This splendid Temple of Bacchus has already inspired many visitors, and in fact the decoration of the door frame made its way into the pattern book entitled Models for Manufacturers and Craftsmen, which Peter Christian Wilhelm Beuth and Friedrich Schinkel published in Germany between 1821 and 1837. Please click on the arrow below the image on your tablet to see a plate from this book. Something similar happened with the coffered ceilings from Palmyra. Their decorative forms were once in vogue for English country houses. This is not an accident. As early as the mid-eighteenth century, the Irish-British antiquarian Robert Wood published two books filled with drawings of Palmyra and of our site. The idea of a World Heritage Site, and by the way, Baalbek is included in their number, is by no means an abstraction. Baalbek has quite clearly influenced people around the globe for centuries. We are now standing in the doorway of the Temple of Bacchus on a wide threshold that still has the mortises of the door wings and even traces where the door bottoms scratched the soft limestone. The door was nearly six and a half meters wide and thirteen meters high, a huge portal that was not intended to be used by common people. By entering here, you took a step into the divine realm, into the home of a god whose identity in this temple we do not know with certainty, but which we assume was associated with fertility. That horizontal block high overhead is called the lintel. It forms the counterpart to the door sill, and it is so enormous that it was created not with one but three blocks. The two outer ones wedge in the middle stone with its slanted sides. However, in the aftermath of earthquakes, by the 18th and 19th centuries, it had probably slipped down to the point where it would only have hung loosely from the corners and would surely have fallen down soon had it not been buttressed from below. It was not until the German excavation started at the beginning of the 20th century that it was raised and secured again in its original position. On the tablet, you can see the complete remarkable decorative relief on the underside of the lintel blocks, although the part on the right has, unfortunately, not survived. We are located in the cella of the Temple of Bacchus, one of the choicest places of Roman antiquity that we can still visit today. In hardly any other temple has the interior been as well preserved as here. The Pantheon in Rome may be comparable but it underwent a great deal of remodeling over the centuries. Let's start with a description of what we find here. 
please turn to the left or to the right and look at one of the side walls. They are divided into zones by half columns, in between which are two rows of idiculas. In the idiculas, many statues would have been displayed, similar to what we see in the altar court. The decoration of the Corinthian order is of a very special richness. In many places, the stonemasons have performed true miracles, carving down to the smallest details. Let us see what this temple looked like in antiquity. On the sides, along the walls in front of the high column pedestals, three steps run all around the room. They make no sense as a staircase. There's obviously no place to go. No, these steps were used for seating. The temple interior, a sacred place, also served for meetings, listening to speakers, attending spectacles, or celebrating rites. We do not know who gathered here, when and on what occasions, but we can safely infer from the architecture that the temple must have served a variety of functions. Unfortunately, much less is reported in ancient sources about this temple, even less than about its larger neighbor. At least the Temple of Jupiter has left us some inscriptions. It is often depicted on ancient coins, and it is mentioned in some ancient literary sources. In contrast, a cone of silence sits over the Temple of Bacchus, this magnificent, richly decorated, and very large building. It seems almost like an irony of fate, given that this temple is by far the best preserved at Baalbek, that we actually know more about its neighbor, the Temple of Jupiter, of which only six columns remain intact. We are standing in the area of the so-called Temple of Venus. It is a space isolated from the outside world, as is the main sanctuary. But whereas the sanctuary of Jupiter stands out from the city and dominates the entire surroundings, this one here is almost unnoticeable behind the colonnades. But at the time when we are visiting Heliopolis, around the year 200 of our era, these structures were not yet very old. The colonnades dated back only a few decades, or perhaps even less. You can see a small temple with four columns in the pronaus. It has the modern name, the Temple of the Muses, and is of the Pseudo-Peripteros type. The term simply means that it does not have a colonnade running all around the cella, but rather we see half columns engaged in the walls. This gives the impression of truncated, or pseudo-colonnades. Although the columns have Corinthian capitals with the lush leaf wreath, here we do not find the typical drilling lines and the leaf tips that typify the acanthus. They are not detailed in stone, but at most would have been painted on. We call this form blocked out capitals, and they do not appear on any other temple in Baalbek. The Temple of the Muses stood on a podium, as is typical for Roman temples, with a staircase leading up to it at the front. Inside, however, there was an adyton by the back wall, which is so typical of Syrian temples and is related to local cult traditions. In the Temple of Bacchus, this type of adyton is almost completely preserved. The one here is probably the oldest example in Baalbek, perhaps even in the whole of Roman Lebanon. Opposite the temple is an altar carved out of the living rock. Only a few unadorned blocks of limestone give it a simple frame. The temple and altar form the oldest core of this sanctuary. As the city grew, the great temples increasingly took over local references. Once the great sanctuary of Jupiter was built nearby, who still offered up sacrifices before the small temple? Roads were extended, and in the early 3rd century the building disappeared behind walls when it was already much deeper in the terrain, which had risen up owing to the silt left behind by repeated flooding. And another temple was added here. It is oriented perpendicular to the Temple of the Muses, facing north toward the forecourts of the Temple of Jupiter. It is a very special building. Not only is it a round temple, but a horseshoe-shaped one at that and it has a straight facade with a pediment like a normal temple. Its semicircular back, in turn, has several concavities, 
which contrast with the flat facade. This not only makes the temple seem more dynamic, but at a distance makes it resemble a seashell. For this reason, the structure has long been called a cult temple of Venus, the goddess born from the sea. We hasten to note that this is pure speculation. We are standing in the entrance of a temple acknowledged as the most unusual sacred building here in Baalbek. Its interior is somewhat similar to the exedras we see in the altar court of the Jupiter Sanctuary. Two rows of idiculas divide the wall, once again providing room for statues, as, for example, we saw in the temple of Bacchus. However, here there is no place for a central cult statue. That is why it is a matter of debate if we are dealing with a temple at all. Perhaps it was a place of special worship, possibly for a hero of the city. Unlike on the walls of the rounded exedras of the altar court or those in the temple of Bacchus, no engaged columns divide the walls of the room into decorative zones. If there was a statue of the gods here, did it perhaps stand in the middle of the room? Let us take a look at the way the building appears today. We can state with certainty that it was dedicated as a church in late antiquity. To this day, a cross painted red has been preserved inside. Local folklore connects the building with St. Barbara, a Christian martyr. When the German excavators started their work in Baalbek in the early 20th century, the round temple had been completely swallowed up by houses which were demolished so that today's freestanding structure could be restored at that time. The smaller Temple of the Muses in front of it was not found until 50 years later. As great as the sanctuary may be in terms of length, as high as the temple's columns may tower up, as symmetrical as the building complex may be, as excellent as the craftsmanship of the stonemasons expressed in all the marvelous carved ornamentation, the truly sensational thing about Baalbek is hidden from most tourists. It can only be seen from the back of the sanctuary where we're standing now. We see two courses of stone, and each block is 19 meters long, 4 meters high, and equally deep. The weight is an incredible 700 tons per block. Three such stones suffice to span the entire width of the temple podium. These limestone blocks are the biggest ever quarried by human beings anywhere in the world, and the biggest ever put on top of each other to form a construction. What purpose did these stones serve? Like most Roman temples, the Temple of Jupiter stood on a high podium, which raised the building above the hubbub of the surrounding city and increased its visibility. At most Roman temples in Lebanon, the podium consists of three courses of stone. Since the Temple of Jupiter stood on a podium that was 14 meters high, the three stone courses had to be correspondingly high. In front of us, we see two such blocks, and three additional stones of the same dimensions are still located in a quarry a good kilometer from this spot. So in order to complete the podium, everything had been prepared for a further three blocks, each weighing 700 tons, to be lifted atop the two we see here. Here stands a temple with ten columns across the facade, each column twenty meters tall. The altar court is as big as one of the imperial fora in Rome, and the entire sanctuary is over three hundred meters long. Other temples and Baalbek's theater may have been built with normal Roman dimensions but we also find a huge banquet hall and a Roman bath that was modeled on the great imperial public baths in Rome. Making a show of size, and thus both of their own performance and pretension, was obviously longer priority at Baalbek. At some point, the ancient citizens decided to do something monumental, and their claim to do so did not rest only on size. In this context, think of the logistic achievement of organizing the transportation of all those columns of rose granite brought from far away Aswan in the south of Egypt. Think of the amazing accomplishment of quarrying the biggest stone blocks in human history. 